Good morning. It's great to see everyone this morning. Uh, beautiful day. And it's time for us to, to look at the scriptures and what they have to say to us. I want to talk about, uh, continue to speak about this series that we've been doing called Six Functions of Church. What does church do? We've been talking about the community of the faithful, the community of believers, uh, the church and what it means. It's been mentioned in our worship. It's been mentioned as Tim was closing worship and in prayer. And uh, there are six things that I see that are essential to our life as God's people. We spend time in worship, corporate worship and individual worship. We spend time in prayer, corporate prayer and personal prayer. We spend time in fellowship, that is, time that we spend together uh, helping one another, doing things together, just being together, uh, what we call community, encouraging one another, holding one another accountable. Uh, we also spend time hearing the Word of God, both personally and corporately. We encounter God's Word. We also have encounters with the Holy Spirit. That's the fifth thing, that God speaks to us and acts in our midst personally and corporately by Spirit. And finally, we also, but not last but not least, we are called to mission and to service as God's people. Today, we're talking about, and this, the next two times that I speak, uh, later in the month, uh, I'm going to talk about this third element, which is fellowship or community. I want to talk to you about community. So today we're going to talk about living together. That's not about cohabitation, by the way. Um, that was supposed to be funny, but it <laughs> didn't go over. Uh, living together, working together, serving together. When I was a boy about 12, uh, my brother, who was a couple years younger than I, had a birthday party. And he invited the kids in the neighborhood to come to his party. There was a lot of kids in the neighborhood, and he invited those who were close to his age. There were several brothers in one family who were very close to my brother's age. One was 9, one was 11. My brother was probably 10, about his 10th birthday. And he invited the two brothers. Now, there was a younger brother who was about 6 who did not get invited. And uh, he was just really too young to enjoy a big birthday party time with the big kids, the 10-year-olds. And so he wasn't invited. So they all came over. They were having a time together. These two brothers were there, among others. And all of a sudden, I heard a knock at the door. And my mom said, go, go see who's at the door. So I went and I opened the door. And here is six-year-old little Mike. Mike was one of the brothers. It's the funniest thing. He had on a football helmet. <laughs> he had candy bars stuffed in his helmet. And he had his hands over his face. And it was obviously that he had really been crying. And his, fear, his face was streaked with tears because he had not been invited to the big kid's party. And so we said, Mike, what are you doing? And he says, I have some presents, which were these candy bars in the football helmet. Don't ask me. And we invited him in. What was it that created so much grief in this little boy's heart? What was it that he was desiring, that he was longing for, that he wanted so badly that he would uh, venture out and knock on a neighbor's door and ask to come in to a party? Well, I think it's quite simple. He was craving and desiring the affection, the fellowship, the time together with his brothers and with the other kids in the neighborhood, and he just felt left out. He wanted to be part of the group, part of the community. It's rooted in our heart to desire to be part of the group, to be part of the community. And that's what we've been talking about a lot today. What is church? It is the community of the faithful. I've mentioned this before, uh, and uh, I, I think it illustrates this well. 
Love to drive on occasion, every once in a while, up onto Skyline Drive. As I go up on the Skyline Drive, I go to the, one of the overlooks, and I look down into the valley, and you know, you see all these farms out there. And you know, there's this one farm that I look at from the, from the uh, overlook, and I look down into the valley, and I see this farm, and it's an amazing place. It's a place where life is perfect. All of the animals, the, the hens lay eggs every day. <laughs> the beef cattle reproduce and they're never a problem and they they're never have to get up in the middle of the night to, to deliver the calves. It, everything works perfectly. The, there's a family on this farm who is in perfect harmony. All of the children do their tasks and their chores immediately when they are asked to, and there's no complaining whatsoever. It's kind of like home on the range. Home, home on the range, where the deer and the antelope roam, where never is heard a discouraging word, and the, uh, the deer and the antelope play, where never is heard a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. There's this amazing place. There's only one problem. When I get in my car and drive down into the valley and look for this farm, it's nowhere to be found. It simply doesn't exist. It's something in my mind. It's something that I think we crave, that we desire, that we would like to experience. Perfect community. And so here we have this tremendous desire for community. It's kind of hardwired into most of us, if not all of us. And I think this hardwiring comes directly from the hand of God because we are taught that God is a community. He is a unity but a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in the Godhead there is perfect community, perfect unity, and yet unique personality, three in one and perfect harmony. And it is in the human heart somehow to reproduce that on earth. But we find this very difficult because I think if we look at this honesty, honestly, this desire for community is both a blessing, this desire for it, but it's also a pitfall. And I'll tell you one of the primary reasons it is a pitfall. It is because community is made up of human beings. That's why it's a pitfall. And we can find many things to accuse in community. But the truth is, one of the primary accusations, if accusations are going to be made, need to come back to those of us, each one who participates. Here's the problem. It's written in Ephesians 4. I'm not going to look at the section that we're going to put on the overhead yet. I'm going to look at the human condition for a moment. This is what Paul says about the human condition. This is what Paul says about people who make up community. This I say and earnestly testify in the Lord. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. They become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. So what, what, what's the issue here? The issue is this. We crave and desire. Our human nature craves and desire to be in the party, not out of the party. 
Human nature craves and desires that existence where there's harmony, where there's unity, where there's fruitfulness, where people are working together. People enjoy being together, and yet our experience is different from that. And the reason is, as I have already said, is community is made up of people, and people fit the description that Paul just made of us in our fallen and unredeemed condition. The truth of the matter is, we want community, but often the reason we want it is so that we ourselves want it. We want community often because it is to meet and fulfill a desire that we have, not necessarily our desire to meet the needs and to bring blessing and service to others. In other words, the problem with community is our own, often our own selfishness. So how do we get past that? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who wrote a book called Life Together, and a lot of my thoughts kind of reflect some of his thoughts, wrote this. Christianity means community through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. No Christian community is more or less than this Whether it be a brief single encounter or the daily fellowship of years, Christian community is only this. We belong to one another only in and through Jesus Christ. So what Paul has said, this is an endeavor we can't carry out on our own. This is an endeavor we can't fulfill in our own strength, in our own power, and simply to meet our own desires. We need the grace of God. And the grace of God is found in the gospel. The gospel not only forgives us of our sins, but gives us the power to take off those traits, those attributes, those attitudes that hinder not only our fellowship with God, but our fellowship with one another. And it is the gospel that enables us to put on those attributes, attitudes, desires, and ways of being and thinking and acting that causes us to actually be Christ to one another. That is what I mean when I say a function of church is fellowship. The Greek word is koinonia, sharing a spiritual life in common. Sometimes we're looking for something else. Sometimes we're looking for something that is almost a carnal idea, some kind of a of an appeal to our own pride or what we might feel is a super spirituality. Again, Bonhoeffer, in life together. Bonhoeffer, by the way, was a Lutheran pastor during the time of World War II. He was imprisoned and martyred for his resistance to the Nazi regime. And he wrote this book before the time of his imprisonment. He says, one who wants more than what Christ has established does not want Christian brotherhood. He's looking for some extraordinary social experience which he's not found elsewhere. He's bringing muddled and impure desires into Christian brotherhood. This is the danger of confusing Christian brotherhood and some wishful idea of religious fellowship, of confounding the natural desire of the devout heart for community with the spiritual reality of Christian brotherhood. The truth is this, Christian fellowship is not an appeal to some lofty ideal or super spiritual concept of what it means to be in genuine Christian fellowship. It is the nitty gritty of living with other people who have lots of faults, difficulties, and problems and burdens to bear. And the truth is, if we will be honest ourselves, we we contribute our share of all of those things to life together, to living together. And so while we're looking for that farm that we see up on the overlook, what we find is something a little bit different. Looking for the perfect church? Did you find it yet? Let me know about it. I'm going there as soon as I can. 
And as soon as I get there, it will lose its status. <laughs> the key to Christian community is a work of grace, personally received and extended to others. That is the key to Christian community. Let's look at Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. This is a lengthy reading. I want to read it, and then we'll read 25 through 32. Here's Paul. It's a classic passage on the nature of Christian community. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? And he who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro, by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And then that last section which is 25 through 32 as well. <clears throat> Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. And let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it might give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Well, that's a rather lengthy reading from most of Ephesians 4, where Paul is talking about the nature of Christian community, the nature, actually, of the church. And we're going to look at briefly at four things that Paul tells us in this passage. First of all, what he tells us is, is that as far as Christian community, as far as the fellowship that we share as God's people, it is the Trinity that is the source of true community. There is one Spirit. There is one God. There is one Lord. There is one Father. There is one faith. There is one baptism. The unity that we share flows out of the Godhead, out of his community, comes our community. That's why the community of the faithful, the church, is different from any other community in the world. It flows from God, and it is connected to God. Christ gave uh, the leaders of the church, the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, and the teachers, for the sake of building up the church, but it is Christ 
who gave. And as we grow up, we are growing up, verse 15 tells us, into Christ. So all grace that we experience, everything that we have, comes from the Godhead. It comes to us through Jesus Christ. And as Bonhoeffer said, Christianity means community through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. Secondly, the church, that is God's people, the believers, God's people are the mediator, the vehicle, the means of community. In other words, it's not just our relationship with God. It is our relationship with one another in God. That is how God works. That is how God communicates himself to us. Every part is making a contribution. Every part has received grace. Every part is building up and serving every other part. That is God's plan. It is not simply a disconnected, singular relationship, me and God. It is God and his people. Everywhere, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God says, I will be their God and they shall be my people. I will be their God, they shall be my people. Not I shall be their God and he will be my person. I will be their God, they shall be my people. God has always looked for, gathered, and called a people to himself. And yes, the call is individual. It's something we experience as individuals, but it's something that we walk out as a community. God gives ministry gifts to equip the people of God. We're told that grace is given to each person and each part of the body supplies something. When you withhold your participation, when you withhold your gifts, when you withhold the special thing that God has put into your life, when you withhold it from the body of Christ, we are the poorer for it because it is God's spirit working through you that builds up the body of Christ, that encourages us. And it can take so many forms, so many forms that aren't necessarily visible. That's why Paul uses the uh, description of a body you, can, you cannot see the things that are taking place inside, but they're vital to your health, to your well-being, and to how the body functions. And so many of the things that take place in the body of Christ are unseen. Many of the services performed are unseen. It does not mean they are unimportant. In fact, they might be absolutely, actually are absolutely essential. So the Trinity is the source of true community. The church, the people of God, is the vehicle, the means by which community is expressed. Thirdly, humility is the glue of true community. Paul said very early, I urge you to walk in a manner of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, forbearing one another in love, humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance, love. These are the graces that f should be flowing out of our hearts if we want true Christian community to be effective, to actually work. Humility is the glue. It is absolute necessity that humility be present in our hearts and among us for this to work at all. Community, according to the scriptures and according to this passage, requires immense patience. He, he uses Twice, he says, gentleness and patience and forbearance. Patience and forbearance are two separate words. One of them means, is often translated in the older versions as long-suffering. Do you have any brothers and sisters in your family who cause you long-suffering? 
Do you have any brothers and sisters in Christ with whom that relationship just has to be massaged and encouraged? Macrothumia. I was going to talk on this point a little bit about macrothumia and marriage. Sounds good, two M's, macrothumia, long suffering and marriage. That does not mean marriage is about suffering, but it does mean, <laughs> I'm just digging myself a hole here. I hope I can get out. It does mean that you have to be in it for the long haul. That the foundation of your relationship is your commitment to it. It is not a short-term thing. It requires your complete devotion and commitment. And it will involve, at times, macrothumia. And it's true in the larger Christian community. There's always something to push you in one direction or another, always something that will get your goat. And uh, as uh, one gentleman said, if you don't want people to know where uh, to get your goat, don't let them know where you tied it up. Macrothumia is a word that gives the idea of a soldier who's on a difficult assignment. It's the idea of a swimmer who's swimming against the tide. It's the idea of a doctor who is working with a patient over a long period of time to bring about healing. It is only a humble person who is willing to make that kind of commitment. So humility is the source, it's the glue, not the source, the glue of true community. So what if, 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 if we are called to humility, and uh, I heard, and I think this is, was one of Steve Wampler's posts, by the way, he's often posting great words of wisdom on this, these texts that uh, he sends out to a number of us. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of others more. So God calls us in this passage to patience, to being careful in our speech. It says, be angry and sin not. To be careful about conflict. It tells us to work with our hands and to be generous toward others. And it calls us to exercise forgiveness toward others. This is the nature of humility. Patient, careful in speech, careful about resolving conflict, devoted to work and to service, given to generosity, and willing to forgive. So, if humility is the, is the glue of community, what is the single biggest hindrance to vibrant community? Is it the devil? Is it prayerlessness? Is it being out of style? What's the hindrance to true community? I think this passage teaches us very plainly, arrogance is the destroyer of community. What is arrogance? It, according to Webster's means, it's an insulting way of thinking or behaving that comes from believing that we are better, smarter, or more important than other people. This is the attitude that Paul says we have to take off. God, we are told, resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Arrogance and pride are a, are a couple. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, again, wrote this. The man who fashions a visionary ideal of community demands that it be realized by God, by others, and by himself. He enters the community of Christians with his demands and sets up his own law and judges the brethren. And God himself, accordingly, he stands adamant, a living reproach to all others in the circle of the brethren. He acts as if he is the creator of the Christian community 
as if his dream binds men together. And when things do not go his way, he calls the effort a failure. And when this ideal picture is destroyed, he sees the community going to smash. This is the picture when our hearts become lifted up, puffed up, Paul would say. Paul says, take those things off. Take them off. They are human. They are part of the natural man. Put on instead a heart of forgiveness, a heart of patience, a heart of compassion, and a heart of long-suffering. Because God in Christ has forgiven us. Again, Christianity means community through Jesus Christ. No Christian community is more or less than this. Whether it be a brief single encounter or the daily fellowship of years, Christian community is only this. We belong to one another only in and through Jesus Christ. I remember when I was in my first Christian community and I had been praying for the gift of prophecy, saying, Lord, I really would love to prophesy. I didn't really know what it was and I didn't know what I was praying. I said, Lord, give me this gift. And I just knew that in this particular fellowship when people were worshiping and praising, it would get real quiet. Do you remember that? And then somebody would speak up and prophesy. And so I was a brand new Christian, and I was praying, Lord, help, give me a message for the church. So we came together, and everybody was worshiping, and it got real quiet. And I thought, oh, this must be the time to prophesy. And so I said, the first thing that came to my mind, woe unto you. <laughs> woe unto you who are bearing children in that day. Do not come down from the housetop, for I am coming soon. And I thought that was a prophecy. And then it got real quiet, just like it is here. <laughs> got real quiet. And after the service, and I was fairly new to that community, after the service, no one wanted to talk to me. <laughs> Every time I came near someone, they kind of walked away. The next week... Apparently, there had been a big meeting. <laughs> the next week, the leader of the uh, community walked up to me and said, uh, you know, we've been thinking about the uh, word that you gave us last week. We can't confirm that that was from the Lord. And I said, well, that's just the price you're going to have to pay if you're going to be a prophet. <laughs> People aren't going to listen to you. Finally, I had to repent and realize that my idea of what a prophetic message was wasn't necessarily what the Lord's idea of a prophetic message was. And so I had to repent. The next week, I just thought about it, and I realized God was showing me that I had done something wrong, and I went into the group the next week, and I, uh, as the group, this is the third week, I went into the group, and we were meeting, and I said, look, I, had some, I have something to say. <laughs> Everybody got real nervous <laughs> all of a sudden, and I said, I really want to apologize because I am convinced that what I shared from you really wasn't from the Lord at all. I just was quoting scriptures out of my head. I thought that's what prophecy was. They were so gracious. They said, we forgive you, Steve. We love you. And they all came and put their arms around me. And they knew I was like three weeks old in the Lord and really didn't know any better. But we have to humble ourselves. We have to lay aside what we believe is our understanding and embrace Christ's purpose. Do not grieve the spirit, he says. Now there's a difference between grieving and quenching. Grieving is when there is bitterness, anger, cla uh, clamor. Quenching 
is when we don't allow the spirit to express himself. I think grieving is a far more serious problem. Because when we grieve the spirit, the electricity that flows among us that creates community gets short-circuited. And it is only repentance and humility and a willingness to accept responsibility and to take off what is arrogant and to put on Christ, which is humble, that allows the life of God to flow among us. Otherwise, the spirit of God is grieved and his influences aren't felt. So repentance is in order. Fifthly and lastly, the gospel itself personally applied to ourselves and to others is the life of the community. In other words, the key to Christian community is a work of grace personally received and extended to others. Here's the way Paul put it. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let our bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Whatever is troubling you, whatever has created problems for you in community, your debt to God is far greater than anyone else's debt to you personally. And so the Lord says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So here are the questions as we close. First and most important question about community, about finding community, Christian community is, are you in Christ? Are you in Jesus Christ? Otherwise, it's impossible to find the grace to be in community. Are you in Christ daily taking off what hinders community and putting on what brings community? Are you embracing, you and I embracing an attitude of humility? Are we praying for others? Those who despitefully use us, are we addressing our potential for anger? It says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Are you addressing issues of forgiveness? Are you extending forgiveness to people in your family, people in your workplace, especially people in the brotherhood of the faithful? Are you praying for them? That's an important question. Someone said, as I've said before, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other guy to die. Are you laying aside unrealistic expectations of what others will do or should do for you? Do you stuff your anger and fail to deal properly with conflict? Are you and I speaking the truth in love and keeping short accounts with those around us? Do we understand how utterly dependent we are on the grace of God for community to work and to function? God has placed many opportunities for us to be tested in our Christian life in the context of community. Our maturity and our sanctity are tested in the context of community. Therefore, we're built up and we grow in the context of community. And that can be in our families as well as in our church because the family is intended to be a small church. According to the word of God, the key to Christian community is a work of grace personally received and personally extended to others. Not just received, but extended to others. Let's pray together.
Lord, we praise you and we thank you because you have given Jesus Christ to bear our sins and you have called us to community together to show love and encouragement and hope to one another as well as patience and forbearance. Thank you, Lord, that the church is filled with your spirit and it is your spirit that brings us into fellowship together and causes us to be built up. Lord, I ask you to bless your church today with a spirit of grace, a spirit of humility, and a spirit of joy and fruitfulness in the Holy Spirit. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.